Dapplegrim. <clears throat> there once upon a time was a couple of rich folks who had twelve sons. And when the youngest was grown up, he would not stay home any longer, but would go out into the world to seek his fortune. His father and mother said that they thought he was very well off at home, and that he was welcome to stay with them, but he could not rest, and said that he must go and would go, so that at last they had to give him leave. When he had walked a long way, he came to a king's palace. There he asked for a place, and got it. Now, the daughter of the king of that country had been carried off into the mountains by a troll. And the king had no other children, and for this cause both he and his people were full of sorrow and affliction. And the king had promised the princess and half his kingdom to anyone who could set her free. But there was no one who could do it, though a great number had tried. So when the youth had been there for the space of a year or so, he wanted to go home again and pay his parents a visit. But when he got there, his father and mother were dead, and his brothers had divided everything that their parents possessed between themselves, so that there was nothing at all left for him. So then... I received nothing at all of my inheritance, said the youth. Who could know you were so alive? <laughs> you have been wandering so long, answered the brothers. However, there are twelve mares upon the hills which have not yet been divided among us, and if you would like, you can have them for your share. You may take them. So the youth, well pleased with this, thanked them, and at once set off to the hill where the twelve mares were at pasture. When he got up there and found them, each mare had a foal, and by the side of one of them there was a big dapple gray foal as well, which was so sleek that it shone. <laughs> well, my little foal, you are a fine fellow, said the youth. Yeah. But if you kill all the other little foals so that I can suck all the mares for a year, you shall see how big and handsome I shall be, said the foal. So, the youth, not knowing any better, did this. He killed all the twelve foals and then went back again. The next year, when he came home again to look after his mares and the foal, it was as fat as it could be. And its coat shone with brightness, and it was so big that the lad had the greatest difficulty getting on its back. And each of the mares had another foal. <clears throat> well, it's very evident that I lost nothing by letting you suck all my mares, said the lad to the yearling. But now you're quite big enough, and you must come away with me. No, said the colt. I must stay here another year. Kill the twelve little foals, and I can suck all the mares this year also, and then you shall see how big and handsome I become next summer. So the youth did it again, and he went up to the hill the next year to look after his colt and the mares. Each of the mares had her foal again, but the dappled colt was so big that when he wanted to feel its neck to see how fat it was, he could not reach up to it. It was so high. And it was so bright that the light glanced off his coat. Big and handsome you were last year, my colt, but this year you are ever so much handsomer, said the youth. In all the king's courts, no such horse is to be found, but now you shall come away with me. Nay, <laughs> called the dapple old colt once more. I must stay here for another year. Just kill the twelve little foals again, so that I can suck the mares this year also, and then come back and look for me in the summer. So the youth did it. He killed all the little foals, and then went home again. But next year, when he returned to look after his dappled colt and the mares, he was quite appalled. 
He had never imagined that any horse could become so big and overgrown. For the dappled horse had to lie down on all fours before the youth could get on its back. And it was very hard to do, even at that, when it was lying down. And it was so plump that its coat shone and glistened as if it had been a looking-glass. This time the dappled horse was not unwilling to go away with the youth, so he mounted it. And when he came riding home to his brothers, they all smote their hands together and crossed themselves. For never in their lives had they ever seen or heard tell of such a horse. If you will procure me the best shoes for my horse, and the most magnificent saddle and bridle that can be found, said the youth, you may have all my twelve mares as they are standing on the hill, and the twelve foals into the bargain. For this year each mare also had a foal. The brothers were quite willing to do this, so the lad got such shoes for his horse that the sticks and stones flew high up in the air as he rode over the hills, and such a gold saddle and such a gold bridle that they could be seen glistening and glittering from afar. And now we shall go to the king's palace, said Dapplegrim, for that was the horse's name. But bear in mind that you must ask the king for a good stable and excellent fodder for me. The lad promised not to forget to do that. He rode to the palace, and it will be easily understood with that. With such a horse as he had, he was not long on the way. When he arrived there, the king was standing out on the edge of the steps, and how did he stare at the man who came riding up? Nay, he said, never in my whole life have I seen such a man and such a horse. And when the youth inquired if he could have a place in the king's palace, the king was so delighted that he could have danced on the steps where he was standing, and there and then the lad was told that he should have a place. Yes, but I must have a good stable and most excellent fodder for my horse, he said. So they told him that he should have the sweet hay and oats, and as much of them as the dappled horse chose to have. And all the other riders had to take their horses out to the stable that Dapplegrim might stand alone and, you know, have plenty of room. But this did not last long, for the other people in the king's court became envious of the lad, and there was no bad thing that they would not have done to him if they had but dared. At last they bethought themselves of telling the king that the youth had said that, if he so chose, he was quite able to rescue the princess who had been carried off to the mountain a long time ago by the troll. The king immediately summoned the lad into his presence, and said that they had been informed that he had said that it was in his power to rescue the princess, so now he was to do it. If he succeeded, he no doubt knew that the king had promised his daughter and half the kingdom to anyone who set her free, which promise should be faithfully and honorably kept. But if he failed, he should be put to death. The youth denied that he had said this, but all to no purpose, for the king was deaf to his words. So there was nothing to be done but say that he would make the attempt. He went down into the stable, very sad and full of care. Then Dapplegrim inquired to him why he was so troubled. Ooh, why the long face? And the youth told him, <laughs> and said that he did not know what to do, for as setting the princess free, that was downright impossible. <laughs> oh, but it might be done, said Dapplegrim. I will help you, but... You must first have me well shod. You must ask for ten pounds of iron and twelve pounds of steel for the shoeing, with one smith to hammer and one to hold. As the youth did this, no one said nay. <laughs> he got both iron and steel, and the smiths, and thus Dapplegrim shod strongly and well, and when the youth went out to the king's palace and a cloud of dust rose up behind him. 
But when it came to the mountain into which the princess had been carried, the difficulty was to ascend its precipitous wall of rock, by which he was to get on the mountain beyond. For the rock stood right up on end, and steep as the side of a house, and as smooth as a sheet of glass. The first time the youth rode it, he got a little way up to the precipice. But then both Dapplegrim's forelegs slipped, and down came the horse and rider with a sound like thunder among the mountains. The next time that he rode it, he got a little further. But then one of Dapplegrim's forelegs slipped, and down they went with the sound of a landslip. Excuse me. But the third time, Dapplegrim said, Now we must show what we can do and went at it once more until the stones sprang up sky-high, and thus they got up. Then the lad rode into the mountain cleft at a full gallop and caught up the princess in his saddle-bow, and then out again before the troll even had time to stand up. And thus the princess was set free. When the youth entered the palace, the king was both happy and delighted to get his daughter back again, as easily may be believed. But somehow or other, the people about the court had so worked on him that he was angry with the lad as well. "'Thou shalt have my thanks for getting the princess free,' said he, when the youth came into the palace with her, and was then about to go away. "'She ought to be just as much a princess as she is yours now, for you are a man of your word,' said the youth. "'Oh, yes, yes,' said the king. "'Have her thou shalt.' as I have said, but first, all that must make the sun shine into my palace here. For there is a large and high hill outside the windows which overshadowed the palace so much that the sun could not shine in. That was no part of our bargain, answered the youth, but nothing that I say will move you, I suppose. I shall have to try to do my best, for the princess I will have. So he went down to Dapplegrim again, and told him what the king desired. And Dapplegrim thought that it might easily be done, but first of all he must have new shoes. And ten pounds of iron and twelve pounds of steel must go into the making of them. And two smiths were also necessary, one to hammer and one to hold. And then it would be very easy to make the sun shine into the king's palace. The lad asked for these things and obtained them instantly, for the king thought that, for very shame, he could not refuse them. So Dapplegrim got new shoes, and they were good ones. Nikes. The youth seated himself once, on, once, upon, once more upon him, and once more they went on their way. And for each hop that Dapplegrim made, down went the hill fifteen ells into the earth. And so they went on until there was no hill left for the king to see. Big horse. When the youth came down again to the king's palace, he asked the king if the princess should not at least be his, for now no one could say that the sun was not shining into the palace. But the other people in the palace had again stirred up the king, and he answered that the youth should have her, and that he had never intended that he should not, but first of all, he must get her quite a good horse to ride to the wedding on that which he had himself. The youth said that the king had never told him he was to do that, and it seemed now that he also had to really earn the princess. But the king stuck to it that he, what he had said, and if the youth were unable to do so, he would lose his life. The youth went down to the stable again, and very sad and sorrowful he was, as, you know, anyone might well imagine. Then he told Dapplegrim that the king had now required that he should get the princess as good a bridal horse as that which the bridegroom had, or he should lose his life. But that will be no easy thing to do, he said, for your equal is not to be found in all the world. <laughs> oh, yes, there is one to match me, said Dapplegrim, but it will not be easy to get him, for he is underground. However, we will try. 
Now you must go up to the king and ask for new shoes for me. And for them, we must ha again have ten pounds of iron and twelve pounds of steel, and two smiths, one to hammer, one to hold. But be very particular that you see that the hooks are very sharp. And that, um, you must also ask for twelve barrels of rye, and twelve slaughtered oxen must be made with us, and, um, all the twelve ox hides with twelve hundred spikes set unto them. All these things we must have. Likewise, um, a barrel of tar with twelve tons of tar in it. The youth went to the king and asked for all the things that Dapplegrim had named. And once more the king thought that it would be disgraceful to refuse them to him. And he obtained them all. So he mounted Dapplegrim and rode away from the court. When he had ridden for long long time over hills and moors. Dapplegrim said, Do you hear anything? Yes, there's a dreadful whistling up above in the air that I think I'm growing alarmed, says the youth. Yes. Oh, that is the birds of the forest flying about. They are sent to stop us, said Dapplegrim. But just cut a hole in the corn sacks, and then they will be so busy with the corn that they will forget all about us. The youth did it. He cut holes in the corn sacks so that the barley and rye ran out of every side. And all the birds that were in the forest came in such a number that they darkened the sun. But when they caught sight of the corn, they could not refrain from it, but flew down and began to scratch and peck at the corn and rye, and at last they began to fight amongst themselves, and forgot all about the youth and Dapplegrim, and did them no harm. And now the youth rode onwards for a long, long time, over hills and dale, over rocky places and morasses, and then Dapplegrim began to listen again, and asked the youth if he heard anything now. Yeah, I hear a dreadful cackling crashing in the forest on every side, that I think I shall be very afraid, said the youth. That is all the wild beasts in the forest, said Dapplegrim. They are sent out to stop us. But just throw out the twelve carcasses of the oxen, and they will be so much occupied with them that they will quite forget about us. So the youth threw out the carcasses of the oxen, and then the wild beasts of the forests, both bears and wolves, Lions and grim beasts of all kind came. But when they caught sight of the carcasses of the oxen, they began to fight for them till blood flowed. And they entirely forgot about Dapplegrim and the youth. So the youth rode onwards again, and many and many were the new scenes they saw. For traveling on Dapplegrim's back was not traveling slowly as may be imagined. And then Dapplegrim neighed. Do you hear anything? he said. Yes, I hear something like a foal neighing quite plainly, a long, long way off, said the youth. It's a full grown colt, said Dapplegrim, if you hear it so plainly when it is so far, far away from us. So they traveled onwards a long time, and one saw new scene after another once more. Then Dapplegrim neighed once again. <laughs> Do you hear anything now? said he. Yes, now I hear it quite distinctly, and it neighed like a full-grown horse, answered the youth. You will hear it soon, very again very soon, said Dapplegrim, and then you will have to hear what a voice it has. So they traveled on through many more different kinds of country, and then Dapplegrim neighed for a third time. But before he could ask the youth if he heard anything, there was such a neighing on the other side of the heath that the youth thought the hills and rocks would be rinsed to pieces. No, he is here, said Dapplegrim. Be quick and fling over into the hawks' hides that have the spikes on them. Throw the twelve tons of tar over the field, and climb up into a great spruce fir tree. When he comes, fire will spurt out of both his nostrils, and then the tar will catch fire. No, mark what I say. As flame ascends, 
I conquer. The flame sings as I fail. But if you see that I am winning, fling the bridle which you must take off of me over his head. And then he will become quite gentle. Just as the youth had flung all the hides with the spikes over Dapplegrim and the tar over the field, and he had gotten safely up into the spruce fir, a horse came with flames sprouting out of his nostrils, and the tar caught fire in a moment. And Dapplegrim and the horse began to fight until stones leapt into the sky. They bit, and they fought with their forelegs and their hind legs, and sometimes the youth looked at them, and sometimes he looked at the tar, but at last the flames began to rise. For wherever the strange horse bit, or wherever it kicked upon the spikes and the hides, and at length he had to yield. When the youth saw that, he was not long for getting down from the tree and flinging the bridle over the horse's head. And then he became so tame that he might have been led by a thin string. This horse was dappled too and so like Dapplegrim that no one could distinguish one from the other. The youth seated himself on the dappled horse which he had captured, and rode home again to the king's palace, and Dapplegrim ran loose by his side. When he got there, the king was standing outside in the courtyard. "'Can you tell me which is the horse I've caught, and which is the one I had before?' said the youth. "'If you can't, I think your daughter is mine.' The king went and looked at both the dappled horses. He looked high, he looked low, he looked before, and he looked behind. But there was not a hair's difference between the two of them. No, said the king, I can not tell thee, and thou hast procured such a splendid bridal horse for my daughter, thou shalt have her. But first, we must have one more trial just to see if thou art fated to have her. She shall hide herself twice, and then thou shalt hide thyself twice. If thou canst find her each time that she hides herself, and if she cannot find thee in thy hiding places, then it is fated. Then shall thou have the princess. That too is not a bargain, said the youth, but we will make this trial since it must be so. So the king's daughter was to hide herself first. Then she changed herself into a duck, and lay swimming in a lake that was just outside the palace. But the youth went down to the stable and asked Dapplegrim what she had done with herself. Oh, all that you have to do is take your gun and go down to the water and aim at the duck which is swimming about there, and she will soon discover herself said Dapplegrim. The youth snatched up his gun and ran to the lake. Oh, just have a shot at that duck, he said, and began to aim at it. No, no, dear friend, don't shoot, it is I, said the princess, and so he had found her once. The second time the princess changed herself into a loaf, and laid herself on the table among four other loaves, and she was so like the other loaves that no one could see any difference between them. But the youth again went down to the stable to Dapplegrim, and told him that the princess lay hidden herself again, and he had not the least idea of what had become of her. Oh, just take a large bread knife, sharpen it, and pretend that you are going to cut straight through the third of four loaves which are lying on the kitchen table in the king's palace. Count them from right to left. And you will soon find her, said Dapplegrim. So the youth went up to the kitchen and began to sharpen the largest bread knife that he could find. Then he caught a hold of the third loaf on the left-hand side and put a knife to it as if he meant to cut it straight in two. I will have a bit of this bread for myself. No, oh, dear friend, don't cut it as I, said the princess again. And so he found her the second time. <clears throat> and now it was his turn to go hide himself. But 
Dapplegrim had given him such good instructions that it was not easy to find him. He first turned himself into a horsefly and hid himself in Dapplegrim's left nostril. The princess went poking about and searching everywhere, high and low, and wanted to go into Dapplegrim's stall, too, but he began to bite and kick about so that she was afraid to go in, and could not find the youth. Well, she said, as I am unable to find you, you must show yourself. Are they oxen free? Whereupon the youth immediately appeared, standing there on the stable floor. Dapplegrim told him that he was due the second time, and he turned himself into a lump of earth, and stuck himself between the hoof and the shoe of Dapplegrim's left forefoot. Once more the king's daughter went and sought everywhere, inside, outside, up until she came into the stable, and she wanted to go straight into the stall beside Dapplegrim. So this time he allowed her to go into it, and she peered about high and low, but she could not look under his hoofs, for he stood much too firmly on his legs for that, and she could not find the youth. Well, you will just have to show you where you are yourself, for I can't find you, said the princess, and in an instant the youth was standing by her side on the floor of the stable. Now you are mine, he said to the princess. You can see that it is fated that she should be mine, he said to the king. Yes, fated it is, said the king, so what must be must. Then everything was made ready for the wedding, with great splendor and pompitude, and the youth rode to church on Dapplegrim, and the king's daughter on the other horse, so everyone must see that they could not be long to get there either.